Hello, in this video, we're going to be learning how to load the IRIS data sets, deal with data frames, and also visualize data from data frames using the Julia programming language. And if you like the description that I give and the code examples that I give, please like and subscribe down below. Okay, so what is the IRIS data set? Well, the IRIS data set is a really old data set used in statistics and machine learning that I personally use often when I teach machine learning courses um, as an example of both regression and classification techniques. So let me scroll down here. So these are the iris flowers. So this data set consists of measurements of sepal length and petal length, sepal width and petal width for these three different species of iris flower. And you, you can tell that the Versailles color and the Virginica flowers here, they kind of sort of look alike. Maybe the Satosa flower looks the same. They're all purple. Um, but this data set is well documented and it's a good one to play with. Um, maybe not but, but just they look similar. So why not look at the features of them and try to distinguish one from the other or maybe try to perform some type of regression task. So here I have my IDE of choice currently for Julia, which is the Pluto IDE. So you can install Pluto um, using the Julia package manager, open it up. I encourage you to go to the documentation. Links for documentation will be in the description below. Um, I'll, I'll also make a video for Pluto um, at some point. Um, but yes, this is the IDE I'll be using. You see that there's going to be descriptions of what we're doing as we go along, and there'll also be cells where we will run code similar to a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so back to the IRIS data set. So um, in this tutorial, in this video, we're going to explore this data set. And what does the data set consist of? Well, you saw the three different flowers. Um, there are three different species that we'll be looking at. Satosa, Versailles color, and Virginica flowers. There's 50 instances of each species. And um, the measurements taken for each species are of petal length, petal width, and sepal length and sepal width, as I just mentioned. Um, and it is a famous toy data set. Um, it's, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's one that I use in my courses to demonstrate simple algorithms, classification, regression algorithms. And I personally like it a lot, though I'm sort of leaning towards another data set called the Penguins data set, which I'll also make a video on soon. Okay, so um, 50 total instances for each species means there's 150 observations in total. So it's a small data set, but not trivial. Um, good for teaching purposes, right? Good for learning and exploring algorithms that you learn in your courses that you're taking possibly, or if you're learning on your own. Um, personally, or anecdotally, no, personally speaking, um, the IRIS data set was the data set that I taught myself machine learning on, taught myself how to deal with data, visualizing data. So I have like a sort of a fondness towards it. Um, as I mentioned before, um, classification, and regression tasks exist, um, though classification can be uh, difficult on all three different species if you're trying to classify one of these three species given the measurements and the data. Um, though it's nice, especially when you're introducing machine learning concepts, that there are linearly separable classes of species, meaning that um, given measurements of, diff of two or two of the flower species, I'm not going to say which ones yet. Um, if you plot them in space, there is a line or hyperplane that separates the data. So it's nice that there is separable data in this data set. Um, and it's also nice that there is not. So if you look at all three species, there is no, no way to separate them completely from each other. So that's a good thing. Um, it's also real world data. Someone went out and measured these things. So I like using real world examples. This is a simple one. I like it. Um, and in this next bullet point I just looked at, I forgot I wrote this. Um, it's a tradition. I think I, I read this somewhere, maybe like Reddit, maybe, that um, statisticians, data scientists, mathematicians like to use um, the data sets that they learned on. 
So I mentioned earlier that I learned on the IRS data set. I taught myself on the data set. So I like to pass it on to my students. Apparently that's not uncommon for other professors to pass on to their students. More or less, if you study statistics and study data science, um, you would have account, uh, encountered this data set before and you have some type of familiarity with it. So when you start talking with someone else or another like student, or if you're teaching one day and you're talking with a student or talking with a friend about data, it's nice to have a reference point. And that's kind of what the Iris data set represents. Though people are, again, as I sort of mentioned earlier, moving towards the penguins data set for uh, reasons I might go into in a later video. Um, and there's also pictures. So we, um, the flowers have nice pictures, as they just showed, we can look at them, we see they're similar, and we want to, as uh, data scientists or machine learning um, people, we want to somehow see if we can separate these, determine which flowers are which, based off of only numerical measurements. Okay, so let's get started coding. <clears throat> now, um, I have to remind you that I am using a Pluto notebook, which is different than a Jupyter notebook, um, and Pluto notebooks only work by putting in um, one line of code at a time or putting in code blocks. You can't type code, um, press enter, enter, type more code. Each code cell in a Pluto notebook needs to contain either a block or a line of code. And again, I'm gonna make a video on Pluto notebooks later so that you understand this more um, eventually. The only exception is comments. So if you see, this comment symbol here. Um, it's just saying that I'm numbering these for myself. As I'm describing uh, this video to you, I like to keep track of where I'm at. So this is like the first cell. So this is what I'm going to do. All right. So um, in order to load the, uh, well, not in order to, we first must load a few packages to do the task. And the task is this. We need to load the iris data set. Um, we need to manipulate the type that it's imported as, which will be a data frame, and we need to work in the Pluto environment. So because of that, I'm going to import, or I'm going to type using the following packages. So using our data sets. So this will import a bunch of different data, data sets, um, of which the iris is one of them. I'm going to be using data frames. I'm going to be using data frames meta for a very specific purpose we'll get to later. And I will be using Pluto UI, so user interface. So um, here we have loading the data set that we want. Data frames is just going to, um, we, we will be working with data frames. Uh, data frames meta will be for a specific, specific purpose and um, Pluto UI will be for printing purposes in our Pluto notebook. So to run this, I just press shift enter and it looks like everything ran. We have these check marks here, so we're good to go. All right, so part one. Uh, the first thing we need to do is to load the data, load the iris data. And there are many different ways to do this in Julia. There's many different packages that come with the iris data set. Um, if we had the iris data as a CSV file, then we could load it using the csv.jl package. But for our purposes today, we're going to be using the dataset function from the R datasets um, package. So the way that this works is that we call the function, we pass in the string datasets, and then we give the name of the string, or we give a string of the name of the dataset that we want. Uh, in this case, the iris dataset. Now, this function is going to return a data frame type. And data frame types are similar to data frames in R, data frames in Python. They are um, uh, basically spreadsheets in code that you can work with. Okay, and I have some description here. Um, so a data frame is data structure that organizes data into, two, into a two-dimensional table of rows and columns, like a spreadsheet, as I said. And it's one of the most common use cases of a um, data structure in programming languages, especially R and Python. Um, and they exist in Julia as well, as we'll see. 
Um, so let's go ahead and load our data. So we have our comment number two, so this is our second cell. And we basically just need to pass in uh, the name as a string, iris, into this function. So, and we need to assign it to a variable. So iris is equal to data set, data sets, and then we need to pass it iris, like that. Press shift enter. So let that run. All right, take a second. The first time that you um, use a package in Julia, uh, there's various reasons for that, but uh, don't be bothered if it's taking a little bit of time. Oh, and there it goes. So there it is. Here is our data frame, and you can see it's a um, rectangular grid. Um, for those of you not familiar with Pluto, when you run cells in Pluto, the output appears above the cell that you ran. So here is the output, and we see that we have columns, several links, several width, petal length, petal width, species, we have a bunch of rows, and uh, all of these are contained in the iris variable. So iris is a, a data frame, okay? So um, a lot of times when you're dealing with big data, you'll have a huge data frame and it's impossible to see all of the columns. It's, you definitely can't see all the rows. So you might just want to look at like a chunk of the data frame, um, maybe the first few rows, just to get, get a sense of what's in there um, and what the types are. So in Julia, if we're going to view the first 10 rows, we're going to call the function first. So this is built in once we've uh, loaded the data frame package. So we pass in our frame, and then we give it an integer with the number of rows we want to look at. In Python, this is equivalent to calling the method frame.head and then the number of rows you want to look at. So let's go ahead and see what this does. So first, um, our frame's name is called Iris, and we want to look at the first 10 rows. So we see we have the first 10 rows of our data frame. And again, this is any um, non-negative integer or positive integer. Um, so we can look at like maybe the first three rows. There's the first three. And it's just a way to get a glimpse at the data that we're working with, okay? So as we see above here, we have a bunch of rows and columns. Um, again, when you're dealing with large data sets, large data frames, um, you would like to know the number of rows and columns that are in your data frame. And in Julia, the way that we will get this information is by calling the size function. So if we call size of the frame, this will return a tuple, giving us the number of rows and the number of columns. This is akin to, in Python, doing the met, calling the uh, attribute frame.shape. So let's see what happens when we do this. Size of iris. So again, I'm using frame here in, these, um, in this markdown. It's just a, a general data frame. But our data frame is called iris, so that's the one I'm going to pass in here. All right, so we see 150 um, rows and five columns, okay? So oh, um, basically what this means is, oh, let me run this cell again, fix that arrow, sorry. Um, so what this is saying that is there's 150 flowers that were measured on, and there were five different attributes for each flower. Uh, keeps on doing that. Um, so if we go up here, we see like this is the first flower, and then we see there are several links, several width, petal length, petal width, and then species. Those are the five different inch, different things that you could measure about this flower. And then for the next flower, there's five different things. For the third flower, there's five different things. So this is what the size is telling me. Okay. Now, when dealing with data frames, you would like to know the column names. So the column names here are almost like uh, keys in a dictionary that point towards the column that you're interested in. And sometimes you'll have like 50 plus columns and you'd like to know the list of all of them. So to get that list of column names, you call the function names, which in Python, you would call the, the attribute columns. So let's just go ahead and see what happens. Names. And then let's throw in Iris. So this gives us a list of the 
of all of the names in our data frame. All right, so we, we know what we're working with at least. All right, so now that we know the column names, we would like to be able to access a single column at a time inside of our data frame. For example, if we're looking up here at pedal length, um, we, want, we might want to know all of the pedal lengths or all of the pedal widths or all of the species, right? So as I mentioned before, the columns sort of act like keys in a dictionary where you pass the key in to the dictionary and it returns a key value. With data frames, you pass a key in and it returns a value, which is the column underneath the column name. In Julia, there are several different ways to do this. Um, so we can call our data frame and then reference the, uh, the, the square brackets like this. And then this is called the bang operator. So bang basically means all, all of the rows. So the first entry here is the rows that we want to look at. And the second entry here are the columns. So if we want to look at this column, whatever name that is, we can do this colon operator and its name. So this code together will access whatever this column name is. Another way is by using the dot operator, which is similar to what you would do in something like Python. Another way is to use the colon here, which also represents all, every single row, and then pass in the column name. The bang operator again, so every row, we can pass in the column name as a string, and then we can do the colon and then also pass in the column name. So in Python, this would be something akin to calling the frame and then the column, and then return a NumPy array. Because in Julia, this is going to return an array, which is more or less equivalent to a NumPy array in Python. Um, we could also use the dot operator here um, in Python and do the same thing. But again, we would convert it to a NumPy array. So let's go ahead and look at the different ways of doing this. So we can do iris bang operator. Oh. So the rows, we get the bang operator, which means every single row. Um, and then we would do, let's, for example, look at like sepal length, right? So that's, a, that's the array of all of the, the sepal lengths. And then we could do the dot operator. So iris dot sepal length. This would also give us the same array. And then what's the next one? The uh, colon operator. So iris colon and then sepal length should return the same thing. And then we can do this with iris um, put in the bang operator, comma, and then pass in the column name as a string. And then in a similar fashion, we can do uh, the colon operator. Oh. All right, so you'll see that all of these do the same thing. Now in Julia, from what I understand and what I've, I've seen done before, um, the preferred way is this way, using the bang operator and then colon, the name of the, the column. Okay. So that's accessing one column at a time. What if we wanted to access multiple columns? This is another common thing um, to do when dealing with data. Well, it's as simple as before, just now, instead of passing a single um, column name, we pass a list of column names. And each entry, or not list, I'm sorry, array. We pass an array of column names. And each entry in this array is either the colon operator before the name or a string. And again, in Julia, it seems to be commonplace that the colon operator is preferred. So this is how I'm going to do it. In Python, this is equivalent to um, passing in a list of strings of the column names. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So iris, colon, and then let's say we want to look at sepal length, sepal width. All 
All right, so now we see that this has gathered all the data from our data frame iris um, in the column sepal length and sepal width. Okay. So next up um, is, I suppose, a little bit advanced, Julia, but um, just bear with me on this. Um, we would like to select uh, um, rows from a column, from, not from a column, rows from a data frame so that a certain entry matches a given criteria. The way that we're gonna do this is using a macro, which you can think of for now as a function, and it's the macro at where, which we imported from the data frames meta package. So when we um, imported or typed using up here, let me make it up here, using data frames meta, we now have access to this macro. And the macro is down here at where. So the way this is going to work is we're going to pass in our data frame. And the second entry here will be, so we have this in function. Okay, so in this list of classes, dot, and then this column. So suppose we wanted to know VersiColor and Satosa. We wanted to somehow return the data frame that are only labeled Satosa and VersiColor in the species column. Then we would type at where frame comma in. So pass this an array. So Satosa and then Versailles color that dot. And then we need to pass it the column that we're looking at. And the column will be the species column. Oh, not frame, keep on messing that up. Iris, Iris is the name of our data frame. So there it is. So this is the data in, our, in the Iris data frame where the species are labeled Versailles color or Satosa. Oh, I was confused for a second because it's only 50 rows long, it should be 100. And it's because right here, I misspelled Satosa. So now we have 100 rows, and the species only consists of Satosa and Versailles color. OK, so um, from our earlier visualizations of the data frame in our notebook, we see that the species are these the species, Satosa, Versailles color, and Virginica, um, which would suggest to us that um, this column is categorical. These are non numerical labels. So let's just go ahead and look at what this is um, and say something like, let's look at the type of function. So this is a built-in function. Type of iris, all rows. And then let's look at the species column. Categorical vector, yes. So it is a categorical vector. Um, we're assured of that, assured of that. And um, it makes sense because again, these are the labels. Um, so um, this species column corresponds to the labels. And if we were dealing with like a larger data frame, maybe we wouldn't know ahead of time what all the labels were. We'd, we'd want to see them, to see the unique ones and not look at the entire list. So for example, if I do iris like um, bang species, just like that, it doesn't really do anything, right? It, it, it doesn't tell me, um, Sorry about that. It doesn't tell me um, what's in there. Okay. Um, so if I would like to know the unique values in this column, okay, uh, what we could do is something like this. We could call the unique function. Okay. So these are the unique values in that column, right? And this is akin to making a list of the method unique in Python, as you can see here. Okay. Now we could have also um, learned that this was um, categorical um, and among many other statistical measures of the data frame by calling the describe function. So let's look what happens when we call this.
Okay, so we see that we have the variable name, which is the column, and then we have on those columns a list of statistical measures, measures of centrality, really mean, min, median, max, and then the type. So we would see that for the species column, it is indeed categorical. And then all of the rest of them are floats. And then we can see some description of these. Um, this function describe is uh, similar to in Python, the describe method. And it's often something that you should do when you're encountering a new data frame that you haven't seen before, um, or new data that has been loaded into a data frame that you haven't seen before to get a sense of what's going on. Okay, so next up, visualizing our data. So um, this is a really important aspect of being a data scientist and dealing with data. It's having tools that you can view the numerical values visually. And this is, it should be somewhat obvious that this is important. So um, in order to do this, uh, we're going to need the plots package. So we're gonna do type using plots, and I think I should set my theme to dark. I wonder if that's the correct syntax. All right, it looks like it is. And a list of themes for plots will be in the description. And you can find them here at the plots documentation. So I just picked dark out of all of these. Okay. And you'll see what that looks like in a moment. All right, so now that we have imported the plots package, we set our theme we have access to the scatter function. So when we run using plots, we immediately have access to this function. And this function scatter will scatter um, data in um, Euclidean plane, which means that you need X data and for each X data point, you need a Y data point. And those are the only things that you need to pass into the scatter function, though, in this description here, I list a bunch of different others. And I, you can just plot X and Y, but if you're going to do this in a professional way, you should definitely at least label your, your X and Y axis and give it a title, okay? So let's see what happens if we just plot X and Y. Note though, um, X and Y need to be of the same length. These are required and they have to be the same length. And this is because for each X, you're gonna be paired with a unique Y. So if you line them up exactly, X1 is paired with Y1, X2 is paired with Y2, so forth and so on. Um, so let's see what this looks like um, on our data, our iris data. So let's look at scatter, okay. So the first argument that we give will be our X. So um, perhaps we wanna look at sepal length. Iris sepal length, like that. And then iris, oh, why is it doing that? Oh, my keyboard is messing up on me. One second, where to go? There it goes. So iris, and then we want to look at maybe sepal width. Okay, so that's my y. Close out that parenthesis there. I like lining them up like that. So let's see what happens when I run that. Okay, so the first time you run a function from the plots.jl package, it will take a moment. Um, but after it runs one time, you will be good to go. Okay, all right, so here's my plot, ignore the snow. It's um, winter time right now, so it's a kind of a fun theme I like to have on here. Um, so yeah, so this is the scatter. So um, for each of these points, the X value comes from here and the Y value comes from the second entry. But we can't really um, see any of uh, the differences in species. There's no labels. So let's uh, slowly build up what this should look like. Um, specifically, if I go back up here, we should probably um, put in an X label and a Y label and a title at least. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So 
better. So iris, all rows, column, sepal, length, so that's my x. Iris, um, I must have hit something on my keyboard. Second, pretty good. All right, there it goes. Iris, all rows, sepal width. All right, so next we want to make our X label. And we'll say that this is sepal length because that's what we passed into our X argument. And Y label, we'll make that sepal width because that's what we passed into our Y argument. And then finally, let's make a title. Um, let's call it, I don't know, my iris data. So now we see that we at least have labels. We have um, on the X axis and the Y axis with the title. Um, so next up, let's uh, change the marker size and how transparent the, the markers are, just because it looks cool. Okay, and we can do that. Actually, I can just copy this right here. Um, let's copy that. Oh. I think Zoom is making my keyboard mess up. Copy that. Paste there. All right, so what are we going to do? Change the marker size and how clear it looks. So we can type marker size equals to like 10. And then for how clear it looks, we can type um, alpha equals to 0 0.65. All right, so Alpha is just a number between zero and one that specifies how intense the colors are. So if I change this to like 0 0.15, they barely appear. If I change this to 0 0.95, it's really bright. If I want a little bit of show through, maybe I'll change that to 0 0.65, or maybe even like that. All right, so it's starting to look better, but again, our legend here isn't telling us what the species are, and we can't differentiate the species with this plot. So um, with that being said, we're next going to group the data. Okay, so I'm just going to copy that, paste down here, and I'm going to add the group argument. So we're gonna group by DF, all rows, um, species. So the group um, argument here only works when you have, um, well not only works, but you need to pass it a, an array of the same length of these two arrays. And that's because each pair in this, in, in the tuple formed by these, uh, the X and Y needs to be assigned a value and the value that it will be assigned will be the corresponding entry in this uh, column. So if we run this now, oh, not DF, Iris, that, we see now that, oh, these are the Satosa flowers these are the Versicolor flowers and these are the Virginica flowers. So finally, we have something that we can distinctly see, oh, this species is separated from these two species and these two species are kind of overlapping all over the place. So if we were thinking about classification, it seems possible that we could use these two measurements to distinguish this species from either one of these species. It seems possible, especially in a, if you could put a line right there, you could probably separate that with what's called a linear separator. Um, also, if we focus on just this species here, we see that we could probably run regression um, with input sepal length and target sepal width and get a line that more or less fits this data with the exceptions possible outlier. 
Same thing could be said for the orange Versailles color or the green virginica. So you, this is why it's good for both regression on each species or classification between species because it's easy to regress these, maybe the virginica or the harder one, to classify this species versus these, it's actually it's pretty simple, but to classify this species, the virginica versus the Versailles color, that's, that's difficult. So that's where it becomes hard. And then you have to use non, um, you have to be clever about the, the machine learning algorithms that you choose to classify one versus the other. So finally, um, let's change up the markers and change the size according to the species. And so this is pretty cool. I'm just going to copy that down here, paste. So now instead of marker size, I'm going to say this will be iris all rows, maybe, um, not sure the best one to do, maybe um, petal length, I think. All right, so notice up here we have iris, supple length, supple width, petal length. It's hard to visualize in three dimensions, but we can visualize three dimensions by changing the size of the markers. Um, and then let's go ahead and actually change what the markers look like by passing it a row of marker types. So we can do something like um, type O, um, maybe a, a hexagon, and then finally, um, say star seven, and then be sure to put a comma right here. Now, um, these uh, markers, I just find on the plots.jl um, uh, documentation, and there will be a link to this exact page in the, the description below. All right, so let's see what happens. Marker size is going to be this, so uh, marker is going to be this. Notice now that this is not a single number. This is a um, array of the same length of these arrays, which means that each entry in here is going to be sized according to the size of their petal length. They're kind of hard to see, so we can scale this up by maybe multiplying this array by um, 4.5 or something. Too big, maybe 3.5. To begin, maybe two point five. All right, so now we see that the relative size of the markers are indicated by some scaling of the petal length of each species, and we've specified specific markers by passing in three. There's three classes, so um, the the first class will have marker O, so this is the setosa. The second class will have a hexagon; those are the Versailles color, and the third class will have marker star. And then don't forget your comma. Um, and we can change these. Again, if we just go to the documentation, I see one called X cross right here. Go back over here and I can change this to X cross like that. Um, and any, any number of things we want to like uh, uh, diamond, for example. Just trying to get the, the little setosas to appear more. Now we have little diamonds there. All right. Okay, so uh, that concludes this uh, this um, module, this video, and uh, in the next few videos, we're going to be exploring more ways to deal with the iris data set um, with machine learning techniques, uh, with other plotting techniques. Um, using the Julia programming language. And again, if you enjoyed my explanation and would like me to keep on doing this, please uh, like and or subscribe to my channel. Thank you.